Thanks for joining everyone. So yeah, first I thought I'd tell you a little bit very briefly about pesticide-free towns, because I think most of you are new to this. Uh, so PFT, the idea is uh, to get councils across the country to get rid of uh, pesticides, to stop spraying, spraying pesticides in urban settings. Uh, and so that's the logo that we use. And it's kind of, yeah, we have different campaigns all across the country. So you can see on the right uh, that we, there's loads of little dots there. Um, and so the green dots are places that have already gone pesticide free, thanks to campaigners, really hard work and uh, my colleague, Nick. And uh, so there's over 40 places across the UK that have gone pesticide free already. Um, the, the pink dots are the places that have reduced their use of pesticides. And orange dots uh, are where there are active campaigns and amazing campaigners that are working towards making that change. Uh, so obviously, if you zoom in, there'll be more, etc. But yeah, that's so. It's just really exciting, sort of, to step into this, knowing that there are already so many changes going forward, and so many people across the UK that are involved already in this. Um, and so, by this, what do we mean? Uh, so pesticides in urban spaces. Um, so at last count, there were 38 different pesticides that were used. And by that we mean, uh, so that includes herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, um, mosticides, fungicides. So anything that's going to be, um, anything that's going to be a plant that disrupts different spaces. Uh, so spaces like pavements uh, and hard surfaces in parks, spaces like tree pits, uh, playgrounds and under furniture in parks. Uh, so these are spaces that councils or land managers or potentially residents are going to be spraying most likely or putting powder down uh, to manage weeds, uh, to manage weeds. What else can I say? Yeah. So, you know, what's the impact of that? And sorry, and to say this yellow, the yellow grass that you'll see there is a sign that a space has been sprayed. And most likely if you're in a city and it's a road that doesn't high, have high footfall, then it's likely that actually that space has been sprayed uh, to get rid of all the, the weeds that are going to grow between pavements and things like that. Um, so the impacts of those pesticides. Um, so there are real health issues. Um, so there's the case of chronic exposure. So people that are going to be going out and you know you don't know when the space has last been sprayed. Um, so children in particular are going to be really susceptible to that. Uh, obviously, they have smaller bodies and higher amounts. Will, they'll be affected by smaller amounts, basically, in their bodies. Also, pregnant people, um, the elderly as well. Anyone vulnerable, really, will have a higher incidence of that. And, you know, that can aggravate asthma. There's a whole host of different incident of conditions that that can aggravate. Um, and, yeah, lots of potential effects. It's also this idea that, you know, there's so many different, you know, we said 38 different pesticides. That's going to be a cocktail of different pesticides that are going to act on each other in ways that we're not really sure. It, again, aggravating different situations. And on the other extreme, um, pesticides, and in particular glyphosate, which is the most used by councils, um, has been linked uh, to cancer. So it's, it's, it's considered a probable carcinogen. Um, and yeah, been been linked to things like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and breast cancer. Um, so there there are real health implications. And uh, after um, residues in food, this is the highest the, the space of highest exposure for residents. Um, so yeah, that's really something to consider. And it, you know, it's not just in parks; it can be just on your street. Um, another aspect that's a little bit more what we're going into today is the biodiversity crisis. So I think everyone here. Um, you know, knows that there is an insect apocalypse and that obviously the way we've managed our, our wildlife has not been, uh, has not been positive. And, you know, by spraying all these plants, we're reducing uh, habitat. So we're reducing wild spaces for insects to, uh, to survive in, to lay their eggs, to, um, to feed on as well, different nectars. We're also then depleting resources for birds that are going to rely on these insects and, you know, the whole chain of events accumulates and the result is that a lot of species are endangered because of it and, and threatened. Um, and a lot of species really rely on, on, our, urban, on our urban spaces, um, hedgehogs included. A lot of species have sort of come to cities um, as an oasis and finding that these spaces are just as sprayed actually. Um, and then finally our environment, which is slightly different. I mean, our soils are getting contaminated by these pesticides and groundwater as well. So if you spray on a hard surface that will run off and you know, it'll be near a stream, near a pond, 
And again, that can impact wildlife, that can impact um, costs as well, very practically, of um, companies having to clean, clean the water more. So this is you know, why, why we're asking councils to stop spraying. And the reality is it's unnecessary. Um, our approach now is to encourage accepting more weeds, but very much for spaces that need to be cleared. There are lots of chemical free alternatives that are ex effective and that can be uh, yeah, cost effective as well. Um, so it's all about you know, seeing what your, your area needs, seeing what your borough needs and finding adapted solutions. So you know, if you wanna talk about alternatives, we have a whole host of suggestions on that and a really great resource for it. Um, but really a very important thing that we've seen is that people just need to change their mindsets about how they think of their cities and accept their cities as a greener space in general. So even if you go pesticide free and you manage everything with a chemical free alternative, there's still gonna be maybe a few more weeds that, that come through. And we found there's a report just recently by, uh, by Sussex that found, University that found that actually ragwort, for example, has twice the amount of, well, twice the success of, um, well, the nectar for pollinating uh, insects. So it's, you know, it's also just more effective in terms of helping biodiversity. And it's also a great opportunity for residents to learn more about their local biodiversity, to engage, to, to celebrate actually the unique flora and, and fauna that might appear. So there's loads of cases of rare species being found in, in verges that have been left to grow. Um, and it's a really, you know, there's a sign there in the picture at the bottom, a really great opportunity for people to really understand their local, their local areas better. Um, so yeah, it's not, when we do say to councils, you should go pesticide free, it's not something that happens overnight. It's very much, you know, looking at how to adapt uh, all the different solutions that are there, but it is very much possible. And it is just a question of aesthetics. So the reason we get rid of weeds is just because we don't like how they look. And every so often in very particular situations, there are a few weeds that do need to be removed. And when that's the case, there are alternatives available. Um, so yeah, those are the key, key things in terms of getting rid of, uh, of pesticides. So yeah, the key messages. Um, so yeah, something that's been positive, but that councils are, you know, have more uh, measures in place for biodiversity. We are seeing that across the country and we are all hearing about things that we need to do, like, you know, planting pollinator friendly meadows. At the end of the day, a lot of councils will do that and then either clear those spaces using glyphosate or pesticides in general, or alongside uh, these efforts are still gonna be spraying. So it's really this, this lack of joint up thinking that we're sort of pointing out and saying, if you're going to be doing these great measures, which we all need to, then you, know, you also need to stop spraying pesticides. Um, the other key message is there's no silver bullet. As I said, uh, you, know, you need to find the adapted solutions. It takes time, that's okay. It's not gonna be an overnight thing. Um, and then the public support is really important. So this is sort of where people come in. Um, it's really important to get the message out for residents to support the councils that have made the decision for residents to celebrate the decision and to, you know, not to go right to the council and say, we like it when it's perfectly uh, weed free. And to know that change is possible. I think that's the most encouraging thing running this campaign is that, you know, every, every week there's new spaces that have gone pesticide free and that are doing it successfully. And you'll hear later on from uh, incredible Edible Lambeth um, the way that they've made it happen and continue to make it happen. So that's a very brief overview of Pesticide Free Towns, the campaign. Um, and now I'll just, you know, why we're here, give you an overview of London. Um, so with a volunteer, I have to shout out to this, uh, another Emma that helped me uh, um, with our team to, to gather all this information, but we carried out the 32 different, uh, well, 32 freedom of information requests on all London's boroughs to really understand what pesticides they've used in the last three years, what measures they have in place to reduce pesticides and what measures they have to support biodiversity. Um, and so all that information is online. This map is actually an interactive map that you can find thanks to Sam who's here. Um, she's made it so that you can then click on each borough and actually have the information pop up. And it's really sort of, I, I personally feel like a superpower of having access to all this information because it's, you know, it's not online uh, before we did this research. Um, but our main findings really, uh, are you know it's it's a mixed bag there is quite a lot of things to be to be positive about actually um 
Yeah, so the, the negative aspects, uh, London, you know, councils overall are still using 22 different pesticides. Uh, so, you know, that's a lot of pesticides. And we found that they're, you know, over the last three years, and this is very much an underestimate, use 26,000 uh, liters of glyphosate. Um, and glyphosate is, is a probable carcinogen and toxic to, uh, to insects. Um, so, you know, that's, that's quite a, a big figure, really still that is used and um yeah we found that the, there were nine groundwater uh, contaminants as well so that's you know every time that water the pesticides are going to run off that's going to contaminate groundwater and seven uh different pesticides that were directly associated to cancer in humans um so that's an overview figure not every council will have used that but if you look at yours you know we have the list of what where is what being used um, but the positive briefly is to say that, you know, since 2019, when the, the government declared a climate emergency, lots of councils have started changing their practices. And actually, we found a majority of councils have started um, phasing out pesticides from parks. So very much making that link that green spaces need to be better for residents and, and people. I mean, there are still pesticides being used, but a lot of them have uh, made decisions and intentions to stop using pesticides there. So that's a really great way to. Uh, you know, if they're not, if they're still using pesticides, you can say, well, you said you weren't going to. So that's a nice sort of foil. Um, but the real big thing for us and that I'm really pushing is that I think 28 of the 32 councils have no statements for highways. So for pavements. So all these places, uh, the majority are still spraying um, on, on your streets. So literally your doorstep is going to be next to your, next to the parks. You know, you'll come out of your park and then that space will have been sprayed. Um, so the only two places that have gone fully pesticide free are Lambeth that we're going to hear from and Hammersmith and Fulham. And then um, I'm going to look at my little list to not say something wrong. But yeah, Hackney also has made some really great progress lately. But then places like Barnet, Bexley, Berkey and Dagenham, Hollingdon and Wandsworth are, are, are the sort of lagging behind, shame, <laughs> shaming them for having done really nothing um, when it comes to this. And then there's a real gray area in, the, in between of councils that have done some things that are still spraying, but um, but yeah, it's a gray area. So yeah, that's the, that's the layout. And I'll now pass on to uh, Matthew so that he can tell us a little bit more about uh, London's biodiversity and again, sort of what we're fighting for. And then you'll hear from Incredible Edible Lambeth um, on their journey. Matthew, if you want to unmute yourself and I'll stop sharing. And I will make you co host so you can share. Sorry, Matthew, you're still muted. So, Matthew is the uh, head of conservation or director of conservation at the London Wildlife Trust. And <laughs> There you go. Can you say that? Yeah, you're good to go. Uh, thank you, Emma. Um, I'm just going to give a brief overview of London Wildlife Trust and what we are doing towards pesticide-free conservation. Uh, it's often uh, perhaps to see that us working in nature conservation, whether it's in nature reserves or in, um, parks and other green spaces, that we have a history of not using pesticides, but that's frankly not true. Um, the only way you can effectively keep grey squirrels under control, for example, uh, is by using watering, which is a particularly noxious and inhumane method, but we don't undertake that in London, but just so you know, it's far more ineffective to shoot them, but even though that might be more humane. And I'm not going to open the debate about grey squirrels, but I'll just give you a brief overview of the trust. We are just over 40 years old. We were set up in the London Borough of Hackney. Uh, in 1981 and soon became part of a UK-wide network of 46 wildlife trusts 
So we, our area of operation is Greater London, so 32 London boroughs in the City of London. Uh, and we work closely with our sister trusts who work in the surrounding counties. London is a very diverse, diverse city, not just for people, but for biodiversity as well. Uh, many it might be just a city of foxes, rats, and pigeons, um, but we've got over 15,000 species of plants, animals, and fungi recorded here, certainly from the last 50 years. Uh, very many of these breed here, a uh, fair number pass by, and there's a fair number which are kind of rarities. Uh, and the bulk of those will be invertebrates in terms of the animal. So insects, crustaceans, spiders, mollusks, etc. Um, Matthew, are... sorry, I just have to interrupt just for a second. I think your sound's a little bit low. Would there be any way to make, I think, speak a bit louder? Because I think with your microphone, you go in and out a little bit. Sorry. Is that better? Um, maybe, yeah. Is that better? Yeah, if you can speak as much into it as possible. I think that should be better. Okay. So, yeah, the, the invertebrates uh, form the kind of, not quite the baseline of the life uh, of the food chain, but pretty close to it, and in many ways are instrumental in maintaining ecological uh, viability of ecosystems. And as Emma's already mentioned, we not only um, uh, witnessing a nature crisis. At the core of that nature crisis, particularly in the UK, and many parts of Europe, we're having an insect apocalypse. Um, and that's not just down to pesticides, that is predominantly down to habitat loss. However, it's, it's the industrialization of agriculture over the last 50 years that has resulted in the decimation and the kind of compounding of the apocalypse that has occurred through um, habitat loss, particularly in the wider countryside. Um, and for that reason, the Wildlife Trust at national level, which we're all participating in our different ways, are campaigning to improve the lot for invertebrates. And we use insects as a kind of flagship of that. And you could argue we use fluffy bumblebees and colorful butterflies as a kind of iconic, friendly inverted comma species to grab the public's attention that these are in trouble. And I'm not gonna really go through all the factoids there, but you know, the state of nature reports that have been published in 2019, 2016, and 2013 by a coalition of uh, environmental NGOs have documented this massive decline. And, you know, I remember as a child um, basically being driven down roads uh, in the summer and, you know, having to clean the windscreen uh, or the headlamps from the insect splatter that occurred. Uh, because there was just so much rich of insect life in the countryside. And this just rarely happens now. So, you know, very few, few people report having to clean windscreens from their cars because there are no insects in the abundance that we had in the past. So we are telling stories that we are uh, undertaking to reverse the decline of insects. And part and parcel of that, that story is about actually raising the profile of how important insects are, the importance they play in our ecosystems, and the joy that many of them bring to people in town and city. And one example of that is the work we've been doing over the last uh, 25 years on, on stag beetles, um, which are sap silic species that are kind of dead wood and suffered because park managers in the past used to clear up all the dead wood so that's habitat loss, um, but um, we also can record the decline from other species because of the use of pesticides, particularly herbicides on plants. We do a lot of work to maintain the biodiversity of our ancient grasslands. Um, so we do, still do have uh, ancient grasslands in London that have survived the onslaught of what we call kind of a ornamental and amenity management. Uh, we 
uh, create and enhance water bodies, and we restore wildlife diversity by basically hay cutting from ancient meadows and spreading that hay into appropriate um, sites where we have reduced the nutrient load. And we've been advising on creating wildlife uh, biodiverse lawns in many parks. So there's been a transformation of our park landscapes in the last uh, 25 years. They've gone from being kind of green deserts with lollipop trees and double flowered um, bedding plants, which have their value, but not for biodiversity, into scruffier, more colorful, more untidy sites where the trees, if they fall, are left to rot. And also we have seen, you know, local authorities beginning to reduce the amount of herbicide they spray, but there's still a long way to go. Perhaps the biggest challenge is some of our uh, landscapes, which are pretty crap for people and wildlife, which is predominantly in housing estates. Uh, and there are some you know, examples of good practice in place, but they are by no means uh, as uh, commonplace as they should be. Um, we run a project called Natural Estates, working with eight social landlords. This is the wildflower estate in Tapton Park in the London Borough of Hackney, which has been looking at this pretty much since 2003, through the, the work of John Little and working with the tenant management organisation there. And more recently, we've been creating what we call butterfly banks by stripping off the, uh, the topsoil and exposing the substrate and then you know, seeding that with green hay. How we've been telling the story. But I think to the point of tonight's uh, little uh, meeting is, is this enough? Clearly not. We've had a, had a long-standing policy on herbicides and pesticides, which is to avoid the use of them on our land holdings and our buildings, and to adopt an integrated pest management approach. There are times when herbicides and pesticides might be required although I would say these are very much the exception to the rule. Um, Emma mentioned the uh, ragwort. You know, it is listed as a pernicious weed or a noxious weed in the 1954 Weeds Act. Um, but for agricultural reasons, although nowadays it's the horticultural reasons which uh, uh, we get blamed for for allowing ragwort to flower and provide a fantastic habitat for cinnabar, cinnabar moths and other whole flies and other pollinators. But, you know, let's be mindful of the fact that if we want to use our hay from cutting our meadows, farmers will not take anything that's got ragwort in it. Simple as that, because it's too poisonous. So we have to, we have to recognise that there are constraints from managing our sites in the way that we would like to, because there are systems that work against them. And also because we have a highly uh, nitrophilic, uh, sorry, nitrogen rich soil in London because of the way that we've managed it, because of diffuse pollution, uh, because of many other things. A lot of our land, if we don't apply herbicide and let and just cut it or allow nature to do her thing, then many sites will become very, very quickly monocultures of what are, we would call nitrophilic plants. Two examples here, giant hogweed, which I think is a magnificent herbaceous plant, but it is toxic in the sunlight um, and is perceived by many local authorities as a public health hazard. And it is actually illegal to allow it to spread on your land. So, you know, there are issues that we need to think about how that is effectively managed without using herbicides. The same with another example is broadleaf dock. Uh, we could all tall oak grass, uh, annual meadow grass, which in themselves, um, as part and parcel of a habitat, aren't a problem, but they can, they can quickly overrun and dominate with very little biodiversity value. So again, Raises some complexity. We need to be definitely, happy. definitely complexity.
um, which we can address as well in the questions. Um, just, yeah, just uh, one more minute, maybe, or, yeah, 30 yeah, seconds. So, yeah, so, what are the drivers which we are supportive of and we're committed to and we advise others? One is the Green Flag Award, which is established by Pesticide Action Network uh, with the help of uh, English Nature, as was in 1996. Uh, some of our sites are Green Flag Award, I'm a Green Flag Award judge, and we encourage local authorities to adopt that. Chemical use and peat use, another issue, uh, are critical to that to encourage local authorities to move to zero use wherever they can. And, you know, we are supporters of Pan UK's Pesticide Free London. And just to wrap that up, uh, going back into what is integrated pest management, I'm not going to go through this, but an example of where there are problems is. Um, yeah. This pinkish plant, which is called Bola or uh, water fern, originally from uh, South America, um, can take over and completely blanket a pond. And you can see from the photographs on the right, completely deoxygenates in it and, and fish will die. Now, the traditional way of dealing with that would be to try and would spray it, which would be leave it as a water body, or you try and physically remove it, which is almost impossible because need a couple of millimetres to do it. So a slightly controversial method is to use a weevil that we should eat it. But of course, this weevil is found from outside the UK. So we're introducing another species into the country without recognising perhaps the implications of that. So it's really just a few points that I wanted to make. And thank you, guys, for stop sharing. Thanks, Matthew. I think something um, that you really highlight is maybe more than anything is just the need for more research and more, um, yeah, more funding into into alternatives and uh, because there is so much complexity, as you say, and there's definitely invasive species. I think something, um, yeah, I think the last step when we work with councils uh, is, um, is is invasive species, so things like uh, giant hogweed and, and Japanese knotweed. Um, and yeah, the, the sort of the last frontier, and you'll see in the profiles every so often there's like two liters used, and that's through stem injections into those um, those invasive species. Um, and that yeah, we understand that that's sort of a difficult threshold. And there is new research and new technologies coming through, like um, electrical uh, rods, basically that you can sort of electrocute the plant itself. But yeah, so there are. There are solutions that are trying to be determined, but we do understand that, you know, it is, it is a, a conversation. And again, that's why we say it's not something that happens overnight. It's very much trial and error and, and figuring things out together. Um, but, uh, but yeah, overwhelmingly, I think the message is the importance of creating these safe corridors, right? These green corridors between these incredible sites that um, the Wildlife Trust is, is managing and, and people's homes and outside council estates. And um, so, yeah, thank you, Matthew, for that. Um, and yeah, a, a, a council that has managed to, you know, to go pesticide free and, and is figuring out currently and working with residents is Lambeth. Um, and it's a really uh, quite a unique uh, example. So um, uh, Robert will tell us about their incredible work, the incredible work of incredible edible Lambeth. <laughs> and I will, yes, make you co-host so you can share. Bear with me. Uh, do you need to make both of you co-host, or Poppy, are you sharing your screen? I'm, I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to share the right. slides for him, and then I'll do mine. Yeah, so just me, it's fine. Right, okay. Take it away. <laughs> right, let's see. Okay. Um, oh, why has it not popped up to the one I want? <laughs> Hold on a second. Sorry about that. I, I had it sort of lined up. Um... Right, there's Rob's. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, am I, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, I have, I'm just going to cover um, a bit of the, um, the history of what's happened in Lambeth um, 
since Incredible Edibles been involved and, and up to the present day. And I think Poppy's going to talk a bit about more recent times forward within the council. Um, so um, uh, Incredible Edible has been around, in, uh, Incredible Edible Lamb has been around since about 2011. Um, and uh, the core principles of food production, getting communities together to grow food and pest it, do it in a pesticide free environment because they're all linked. Um, we, we, we need the insects, we've got a biodiversity crisis and we need the insects to pollinate the food. So they're linked together. And we've been campaigning um, since really 2011 with the council at varying levels. And um, so with, with, with uh, trying to get them on board to go pesticide, pesticide free, um, there was political will and they had planned um, over the years to move forward, but it's been a slow process. But we've had stickers like the one um, here. Next, next slide, Poppy, please. Next slide. Yeah. Um, and, and leaflets. Um, yeah. Such as this one um, that we, we give out. And, and when you join, um, and the next slide, when you join, there's a pledge that we get new members to sign up just to get them uh, into their consciousness about going pesticide free, why it's important, and to encourage them to write to their councillors so that we can keep the message going into the council. Um, and anyway, um, next slide, please. It, it, it wasn't until January of 2019 when Lambeth Council declared a climate emergency, the things started changing and uh, we've been talking about parks in, in Lambeth parks, they changed that year when there was a change of management um, to go in-house and they uh, now only use glyphosate for selective um, uh, uh, situations. Uh, otherwise it's tolerance and mechanical means and at very extreme cases they'll use short acting um, uh, environmentally friendly um, herbicides. In the estates, um, they changed in the summer of 2020 um, quite um, uh, suddenly um, and um, it's not changed over, they haven't stopped using pesticides in all situations, um, particularly housing associations are still using pesticides. So we're we're going pesticide freer, but we're not totally pesticide free in Lambeth. Um, within the estates, they still, after two years, nearly two years now, they still don't have any alternative methods. So they're still working out whether to use um, uh, flame sprays or vinegar or whatever. And um, uh, so, but what I'm focusing on today is more the next slide, please, Poppy, is the Lambeth streets. And um, that's where we, we did get very involved. Um, we've had a, a, at the time, we've had a, we we're under a contract with Violia um, to continue right up until April, 2021. And they were spraying glyphosate three times uh, yearly um, on, our, uh, on our streets. Um, and uh, Jenny Bickerseth and myself, um, proposed to Violia um, was quite a struggle, but we asked whether we could actually hand weed our streets ourselves, so opt out of spraying. And they sort of begrudgingly allowed us to, and it was quite a success really. We got um, uh, residents involved and um, um, so much so that at a meeting that we're invited to in November, um, they, they proposed to take it forward and, and um, promote um, opting out as a way for some residents to take it forward. And, and, and then the other thing they did, that's right, was to reduce the sprayings to twice yearly, to May and August, rather than the May, August and um, um, October sprayings. So in 2020, there were 30 streets, sorry, 2019, there were just two streets, myself and, and, and uh, Janney Street, 30 streets and then 150 streets. And 
a lot of this was because we pushed it within Incredible Edible. The council did it sort of fairly poorly. Um, it was back page of our quarterly magazine. Um, um, and um, it, it, but we did, we did get the numbers up and so much so that uh, um, in, in 2021, um, uh, I've, the um, because of that we had 150 people opt uh, streets opting out it was decided that they would stop the spraying early, and so there was only the May um, uh, spraying of that year, and um, that was the last time. And, and and we had a change of contract in in the October instead of the April because of of um, uh, COVID, and we. Um, uh, but there was no spraying further than the May spraying of 2021, which was a, a bit of a success from our side. The other area of, of the next slide, please, um, is tree pits. We've all seen these awful um, um, uh, sort of skeletons of all sorts of plant matter around tree pits that stay there for months and months and months. And um, I've got a, I've, my other um, interest is in a local um, orchard planning group and management group. And so I've got a, quite a good relationship with a local tree officer. And on walks around with him, um, I, I kept saying that we can't, you know, this can't be good for the trees. So he actually wrote to Violia. Um, Violia never replied back to um, our, our tree officer. And, and uh, in fact, um, in, in um, June 2020, uh, sorry, in about the August 2020, um, it was announced that there'd be no further spraying of tree pits um, with, with, without any, any acknowledgement back to the tree officer, but it was a, quite an easy thing to actually do. So it could be something that people, they get a bit of a relationship with their tree officers, bring it up with them. And I think it's a very easy thing to take forward. Um, and the last slide, please. And so we can all have tree pits like this one, which is actually outside my place. Um, and um, this, so just taking um, some practical possibilities for going pesticide free, um, it's, it's writing to your councillors, the, the environment secretary of your councils, um, and, and your MP, get them involved, and writing again and again. And um, we've got hustings coming up with the local elections. That's another way of getting people on board to think about going pesticide free, going to council meetings. I've been to quite a few myself. Um, I've even had the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, Deputy Chairman of um, uh, Chief Executive of Lambeth in my kitchen talking about um, hand weeding the streets. So um, just get get into under these people's skin, and they will they have to start listening. Look at the local biodiversity action plans of your of your boroughs, because um, you can use those arguments to take back to the councils and say, look, we, we've got to do something about what's happening to biodiversity and find out about your spray, the, the spraying regimes and why so frequent. Um, and as I said, get to know your tree officer and plant some uh, wildflower seeds in, and water your tree pits. Um, and if you can, if you want to, um, try opting out of spraying by hand weeding. Um, that's my bit of the talk. I'm handing over to Poppy. Fantastic. Thank you, Robert. And we'll, yeah, we'll pick up some points afterwards in, in the questions, I'm sure. Poppy, if you could um, yeah, keep yeah. the three minutes about. Yeah, so mine, it, mine's going to be super short. And then anything outstanding as well, we can hopefully pick up in the questions or, yeah. Oh, on. Hold on. So I'm from Incredible Edible Lambeth. We support food growing in the borough, as Rob said. I've just been working with Incredible Edible for about the last sort of year and a half now. So I wasn't part of all of that initial campaigning. But what I have is I live on a council estate and also I've done lots of work on council estates. And because of our relationship with the estates team and also the 
grounds maintenance has now been taken back in house as well from the contractor, which actually has been really positive because there's a certain ind few individuals in Lambeth who are actually very passionate about biodiversity in, in the um, maintenance team and people who manage the maintenance team, which is really brilliant because they're very open to it. Lambeth's got its biodiversity action plan as well. So the challenge for estates is, as Rob was saying, like the, the, the challenge to the grounds maintenance teams is, first of all, like they still have the same KPIs and they still got the same budgets. They didn't, they stopped using pesticides, but they didn't have an action plan as to how they were going to manage things differently. So, for example, on our estate last year, I mean, I thought it was rather lovely and still is. Loads of daisies came up. We've got loads of clover, loads of planting, but we did have a lot of deadly nightshade as well around the estate. So, you know, they're, they're like the challenges that come up. Um, and also a lot of the gardening teams, they're great guys and nice people but they're not necessarily trained with biodiversity in mind. A lot of their got previous gardening techniques really are the gardening with hedge trimmer and leaf blower technique, basically. So I think there's, but that's another challenge for the, the grounds. That's another challenge for the council and the people who are managing this contract is obviously a lot of people need, need re-educating and retraining as to how to manage the space very differently. Um, but they don't seem to have the funds so to do that and also obviously there's as we were talking before about the aesthetic a lot of people living on estates apparently um, grounds maintenance is maintenance is the highest um, complaints department I can't believe that but that's what the estates team reckon I'm sure um, so there's definitely a kind of changing how, how, how do people change their aesthetic as to how the estate should look and start enjoying it looking a bit greener. Um, last year, we, we had a project called the Grow Back Greener Project, uh, at Incredible Edible Lambeth. A big part of it was helping six different um, new estates to develop community growing spaces, predominantly food spaces, but we did focus um, a lot on biodiversity as well. Um, but we also did a community research project with Lambeth estate residents to create a new template of engagement for estate land. And we were really inspired by John Nittle as well and what he had achieved on the Captain Park estate, the Poppy estate. Um, and we wrote to him and we took a lot of his, you know, were very inspired by his ideas. Um, so in this template of sustainable grounds maintenance, I'm really happy to send out to Emma and I'm really happy for you to share it with anyone who's interested. It might be a useful document to go and talk to your council about if you live on an estate. Um, we suggest numerous ways to manage estate land more, um, more innovatively with sustainable methods such as wildflowers. Um, at previously like to suppress weeds, um, the council actually were buying in terrible mulch, which actually had like hardcore in it, some of it, instead of reusing um, wood chip from their own tree surgery. You know, so we are proposing that all estates should have a wood chip place where they can go and tip wood chip that then can be used by the gardener. So it's really about getting the councils to think also in a more circular, you know, in a more circular way so that actually they save themselves money instead of them perceiving as it costing more. Um, and also the template really puts education at a, pri a priority. So how do we help residents appreciate more the changing landscape around them as pesticides aren't used um, and to connect with those greater numbers of plants and insects? And, and you know, a, a lot of the, the weeds are actually medicinal plants, you know, and have herbal properties which can be you know potentially that excites people. Um, another suggestion from our research project from, from the participants was that we could have things like biodiversity champions on estate support other residents to engage um, but all of these things take a long time and there's not huge cash injections to kind of make them happen you know so it's like a lot of small steps I feel but walking around our estate 
So on my estate where I live, they're actually implementing their new mowing regimes um, nice. and all of those kinds of things. And that's the link to the template. And the last picture is a little picture of a daisy I took today that's there oh. because it hasn't been sprayed. 